It is now time for question period. Member from Nipissing. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and good morning. Good morning, Premier. My question is for you this morning. Later today, the uh, Auditor General will present her annual report to the Legislature. It will include a look at your government's accounting practices and the province's uh, debt burden, which you've more than doubled in the uh, past 11 years to almost $300 billion. Your wasteful, politicized spending now means you pay $11 billion of interest instead of investing that money in health care, education, transit, and infrastructure. Premier, your government gets drafts of these audits in advance. So what's this year's equivalent of the billion-dollar gas plant scandal? Is it going to be Mars? Is it going to be smart meters? Premier, how much are we adding today to your government's growing record of fiscal waste? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I look forward to the Auditor General's annual report. Uh, it will be tabled later this afternoon, as the uh, as the member opposite uh, recognizes. And, Mr. Speaker, I, you know the, the opposition is heckling that uh, we're not looking forward to it. In fact, I believe that the Auditor General plays a very important role in terms of shining a light on issues that need to be addressed by government, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome her. Uh, I welcome her input. Order. We welcome accountability, Mr. Speaker, and the. The member from Leeds Grenville come to order. And the work that she does is the definition of accountability, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, because we welcome accountability, that's why we are moving to pass Bill 8 today, yeah, Mr. Speaker, uh, which I believe will provide unprecedented transparency. I believe that the ombudsman is somewhere in the, the, the ombudsman is here with us. Answer. And so the accountability that is already in place will be enhanced, Mr. Speaker, as we move towards uh, the Thank passage you. of Bill 8. That's right. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Premier, let's take a look at your typical response to the auditor's uh, reports. Last year, the AG gave you a failing grade on the massive backlog for autism treatment, slow ambulance service, and mandated school lunches that kids are now rejecting in favor of fast food. On all, on all counts, you failed to take her report seriously. She also took aim at your creative accounting with Ontario Northland. You claimed a savings of $265 million by divesting Ontario Northland, yet the auditor said it would actually cost $820 million. Uh, Premier, that's a billion-dollar fallacy that you were happy to perpetuate. People demand accountability from government. Premier, will you commit today to take the recommendations of the auditor seriously Question. and act with the force and focus we all expect from their Premier? Okay, Premier. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. We will absolutely take the Auditor General's report seriously. We always do take the Auditor General's report seriously, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, act on the recommendations, the, uh, the suggestions that the Auditor General makes, and work with the Auditor General. I think that is, I think that is a key part of this, Mr. Speaker, is to recognize that the Auditor General brings a new set of eyes to the uh, operation of government, Mr. Speaker, and works with ministries to understand what it is that ministries are doing to mitigate the uh, concerns that uh, she may have, but also to work with the ministry to point to how we might there seems to be an ongoing conversation between the president of the Treasury Board and the member from Leeds Grenville. It'll stop. Finish, please. To look forward at, as to how we might work to address the concerns that the Auditor General raises. That's the natural course of the relationship between government and the Auditor General. Answer. All governments, Mr. Speaker. We take her report seriously and we look forward to it this afternoon. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, the auditor isn't alone in passing judgment of your risky financial management. StatsCan says that between 2008 and 2012, Ontario ran accumulated deficits of $84 billion. That's 10 times more than the next province, BC, at $8 billion. Lakehead University's Livio DiMatteo says this makes Ontario the worst economic performer in the country. He calls it a travesty and that your policies have, quote, driven down private investment, suppressed productivity and economic growth, killed job creation, and caused a deterioration of public finances. Premier, we want prosperity, better quality of life and accountability in government. Isn't it time to stop politicking and make Ontario first? 
Thank you for your so, Mr. Speaker, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Let's stop politicking. Let's look at the reality that Ontario has been the number one destination for foreign direct investment, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the reality that we have recovered more than 500,000 net new jobs since the economic downturn, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the reality that in the second half of question period. Stop the clock, please. I, uh, I found it rather quiet when the question was being put. I want the same for the answer. Please. The reality that in the second half of question period, there will, inevit will inevitably be questions from the same party about investments in the talent and skills of the people in their ridings, the infrastructure in their ridings, Mr. Speaker, partnership with businesses in their ridings. Those questions come in the second part of question period because essentially the people across the, the floor understand that the pillars of our plan, the investments that people need in their constituencies yes, are exactly what we need to do to restore the economy in Ontario and to keep us on track, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Member from Nipissing. Uh, back to the Premier. Uh, over the past two weeks, we've been hearing from scores of small businesses all over this province. Their message has been clear. They want relief from this government for businesses to thrive and succeed. Relief from crushing Mr. red Agriculture, tape. Come to order. Relief from skyrocketing energy prices. Relief from new payroll taxes like the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan you're planning to ram through this legislature. 94% of small business want you to cut red tape. 93% want, want relief from skyrocketing energy rates. And over half say your pension tax will result in them cutting jobs. Premier, why don't you Minister take Minister of Agriculture, seriously? come to order. Second time. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, will, uh, I certainly will uh, look to the Minister of Economic Development uh, and Employment and Infrastructure because small businesses in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, have partnered with this government very well, and there are small businesses across Ontario that have benefited from investments like the regional development funds, Mr. Speaker, like investments in uh, technology. And and have benefited from the uh, very well-educated workforce that we have, Mr. Speaker, that allows them to expand. But, Mr. Speaker, I just want to address the issue of the, uh, the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. And from what the member opposite is saying, I guess he would call the Canada Pension Plan a tax. Because what, what we're talking about is not a tax, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about a plan that would allow people to put money aside so that they would have retirement security, Answer. just as the Canada Pension Plan allows for that, Mr. Speaker. We know people need this. We know that people across, in fact, across the country are not saving enough for their retirement. We are going to take action, Mr. Speaker, because there are people in Nipissing who need this plan, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Premier, the most heinous example of you not listening to small business is your new tax, pe is your new pension tax. Here's what Ian Lee at Carleton University tells us. He says, by forcing employees and employers to take money out of their pockets for your pension scheme, will quote hurt the economy, quote, eliminates the discretion of taxpayers, and reduces the amount that can be invested where they want. This is not a policy that helps Ontarians. This is not a policy that grows our economy, and it's not a policy that makes it easier for small businesses to stay alive and make Ontario first. Premier, will you do the right thing and put your flawed pension tax back on the shelf? The Associate Minister of Finance responsibility for the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that this is not a tax. In fact, this is an investment in the future of Ontario. The RPP, the RPP is an investment in people's futures and a long-term enhancement to our economy, Mr. Speaker, that will support three million Ontarians that do not currently have a workplace-based pension plan. In the past few weeks, in fact, Mr. Speaker, studies have underscored the importance of closing the savings gap. This is a real challenge that we cannot ignore. We have to take leadership, Mr. Speaker. According to the Conference Board of Canada, six out of 10 Canadians are not currently saving for retirement. And in fact, half feel that they are ill prepared to retire at all. Out of touch. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is in touch with me. Please finish. 
Without action today, this has the potential to stagnate That's growth right. and to create economic uncertainty. Mr. Speaker, we cannot allow that. Thank we you. are taking action with yeah, the yeah. Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, all Ontarians deserve to work towards a comfortable retirement. But there are other ways a government can help make that reality rather than new taxes. When you couple energy prices set to soar 42 per cent and $11 billion— Stop the clock. The Minister of Agri food, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Please finish. Add an $11 billion annual red tape burden and a WSIB tax costing contractors up to $6,000 a year, it's no wonder we lost 2,700 small businesses in Ontario last year alone. This is not how we help small business, it's how you turned Ontario into a have-not province. Given the reduced growth forecast and last month's dismal job report, are you ready to risk more jobs to For save sure. your own. Premier, how does running the most expensive jurisdiction in, uh, in the province help Ontario first? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know, the member opposite is not dealing with the facts. The fact is that this government is continuing to work to strengthen our economy today while making the necessary decisions to ward off a problem that we see on the horizon. Yes. Mr. Speaker, our government is confident Leader, that we are supporting the, the needs order, of business today. Ontario is the first jurisdiction in North America for foreign direct investment. Ontario's tax system, in fact, is the lowest and most competitive yeah, yeah, of any yeah. OECD country and is the lowest in North America. And the Production of the ORPP is another way of making investments to build Ontario up so that when people retire, they will have a predictable, consistent stream of income that they will continue yes, to spend in Ontario's economy. And that, Mr. Speaker, yes, is what we need to do to strengthen Ontario's economic future. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Liberal government is cutting childcare in this province. Sudbury's oh, yeah. municipal daycare manager says their budget was cut by $2 million, Speaker, and he says another $3 million cut uh, could be on the way. The Liberal minister says that she doesn't understand the problem. Well, let me explain. Liberal cuts mean that municipal daycare centres are closing and moms and dads are left lying awake at night trying to figure out where their children are going to be providing, getting their childcare provided from. My question is, why is this Premier closing down childcare centres in Ontario? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, what this government is doing is actually opening spaces in full-day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, that mean that tens of thousands of children are going to have access to that full-day kindergarten program, Mr. Speaker, that otherwise they would not have had. In addition, Mr. Speaker, as we have said, the uh, Child Care Modernization Act that uh, is passed through this legislation, legislature, Mr. Speaker, uh, is, has the potential to open up 6,000 new spaces, Mr. Speaker, licensed, uh, safe spaces, Mr. Speaker, to allow more families in the province to have access to child care. So, quite the contrary to what the leader of the third party is saying, Mr. Speaker, we have worked with the child care se sector. We recognize that the, uh, the implementation, implementation of full-day kindergarten has meant that there is a transition in the child care provision, Mr. Yes, Speaker, but thousands more children have access to safe, affordable child care and full-day kindergarten Thank because you. of the policies of this government. Gee, Speaker, it sounds a little bit like the uh, children's dental plan that the Liberals pretended wasn't being cut the other day. The Liberals talk a lot about investing in child care, Speaker, but here's the reality. The Liberal government is cutting child care across Ontario. The latest example is Sudbury. New investments, Speaker, are nowhere to be found. The municipal daycare manager says that Sudbury hasn't seen— Order. Please finish. The municipal daycare manager, speaker in Sudbury, hasn't seen, quote, 
any new dollars or new investment. It means moms and dads and in Sudbury are worried, and rightfully so, Speaker. They shouldn't have to worry about whether their child will have care next week, next month, or next year. So is the Premier proud, Speaker, of shutting down childcare spaces and leaving parents in the lurch in Sudbury? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just address a couple of issues. First of all, by the drive-by swipe that the leader of the third party made on the, uh, the Healthy Smiles program. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that 70,000 more children are going to be able to get uh, dental care because of the program that we are putting in place, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that she is just wrong in terms of kids losing that care, Mr. Speaker. We have made certain that children who are receiving dental care today will receive dental care go on, on an ongoing way, Mr. Speaker. Those kids are not losing the care. It's very clear in the program that we have put in place those cuts are not happening. So she was wrong on that, Mr. Speaker, and she's wrong on child care. The fact is that since 2003, a 90% increase in funding has gone into child care, Mr. Speaker, close to a billion dollars. We have moved from $532 million to nearly a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. There has been a consistent increase in child care funding. I don't know the situation in Sudbury, and Thank I know you. why the member opposite is talking Thank about. You. Thank you. Final supplementary. Finding affordable child care in Ontario is already a nightmare for parents. In the southwest, Sarnia families watched as Coronation Park Day Nursery closed its doors just last month. In the north, Sudbury families are bracing for the closure of their municipal child care centre. And in eastern Ontario, the Queen's Daycare in Kingston is, has a wait list of 500 children, speaker. But instead of seeing investment, they've lost 137 spaces. Not Notwithstanding the fact that they have 500 kids on their wait list, child care spaces across Ontario are disappearing and families don't know what to do. It is creating chaos. It hurts uh, children, speaker, and it hurts parents and families. Now, I want to know, does this Liberal Premier really think it's progressive to be shutting down public, not-for-profit child care spaces across this province? So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I know why the uh, leader of the third party is talking about Sudbury, because Sudbury doesn't have a representative in this legislature right now. And, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, since 2003, child care funding in Sudbury has increased by... I'll wait. Finish, please. Care funding in Sudbury since 2003 has increased by 110 per cent, from 75 million, Mr. Speaker. To, so, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have consistently increased funding to child care. The other reality is that we have implemented full-day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, and that means that there is a change in the delivery of child care around the province because the four- and five-year-olds who may have been in child care are now in full-day kindergarten. So there are different models developing across the province, but there's more money and there are more spaces, Mr. Speaker. New question. Question for the uh, for the Premier Speaker. Today, the Auditor General will be uh, tabling her annual report. Uh, when we asked, the Liberals couldn't seem to find the business case for Mars for the Mars loan. They didn't know whether they were going to lose millions of dollars uh, of the City of Toronto grants, and they didn't know what the final cost of the bailout was going to be. Speaker. So when the Auditor General came knocking, uh, could the Premier find the business case for Mars, or did the AG also? Also get the cold shoulder, Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just need to correct my record on the last question. The funding for Sudbury uh, Child Care has gone from 7.5 million to 15.8 million, wow. Mr. Speaker. Wow. So, so, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the uh, in terms of the Auditor General's report, I will uh, repeat what I said to the member of the uh, Conservative Party that we look forward to the Auditor General's report. Uh, I'm not going to preempt her announcements this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, but she will look at the uh, look at the operation of the government. She will look at the uh, various areas that she has chosen to examine, and she will give us advice. And she will do that, Mr. Speaker, having worked with the ministry, ministries having worked with her to uh, talk about 
what it is we are doing to address the concerns Answer. that she's identified and what we can do going forward to continue to address the concerns that she might identify. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Auditor General is also reporting on child care. Four children have died here in Ontario since 2013. No parent should ever have to suffer that kind of loss. As a mom, it's hard for me to even imagine, Speaker. And now the Premier is cutting public, not-for-profit not child care spaces across Ontario, meaning more kids will be in unlicensed care. Does the Premier think that cutting funding and closing down public, not-for-profit, licensed child care centres, driving kids into unlicensed child care, is actually good public policy for the province of Ontario in 2014? Thank you. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. The, I think we need to deal with the facts here. The funding for child care in Ontario has doubled to from Silco a North, come to order. since 2003. We have created since 2003 130,000 additional licensed child care spaces. In the last four years, the average creation of new child care spaces, licensed child care spaces, has been on average 18,000 new spaces per year, Speaker. And in addition to that, 265,000 children are in full day kindergarten. That's all the four and five year olds in the province. That is not cutting, that is adding. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you. Oh, the Auditor General will also be reporting on smart meters. Smart metering hasn't reduced electricity consumption at all in this province, and people's bills, Speaker, are still going up. It's caused anxiety for people, especially seniors, shift workers, and low-income families. So this is the chance for the Premier to finally admit that the smart metering program was not so smart after all. Is she prepared to do that today? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Energy, please. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Um, I'm very Trump. pleased to answer that question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, studies have shown that people are saving money with smart meters. Not only are they saving money with smart meters, Mr. Speaker, the, the system is, uh, is generating benefits. Thank you. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I was saying, uh, studies have shown that time of use pricing uh, has been successful at reducing consumption by residential customers during peak periods by between 2% and 5%, Mr. Speaker. In addition to that, it's generating a lot of Answer. savings and costs to the system itself, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it alerts utilities when lines go down, a service that they never had before, redirects electricity to restore power outages. It's improving accuracy in, Come in, uh, in accounting, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member for Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Concerns regarding medical tourism have been raised to your government dating back to at least 2011 by a number of health care organizations, including, among others, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. This practice, in which certain health care organizations attract patients from other countries on a pay-for-treatment basis, seriously undermines our publicly funded health care system, yet nothing substantive has been done to end it. In fact, in April 2014, the previous Minister of Health expressed her support for this practice. Minister, on November 21st, you sent a letter asking health care organizations not to, quote, market to, solicit, or treat international patients. This approach clearly hasn't worked before. So, Minister, when will you introduce an outright ban on medical tourism? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, question from the opposition. Uh, in fact, we have uh, asked our hospitals to end the practice of actively marketing to or solicitate, soliciting uh, international patients to come to this province uh, to avail themselves of our health care facilities. Of course, we're not talking about those important functions that our hospitals play in terms of bringing humanitarian patients to the yeah. province. I think all of us agree. Uh, programs like the Herbie Fund at Toronto Sick Kids uh, Hospital, for example, those programs need 
need to continue. So we're talking about a specific category of individuals who would choose to pay to gain entry to hospitals in the province. Uh, I have to say that it's a, it's a small number of hospitals that to date have engaged in that practice. Uh, there are very specific principles. I'll get into those pr principles in the supplementary that have adhered to hospitals Answer. engaging in the practice of receiving international patients, but we've ended that practice specifically with regards to a marketing soliciting, soliciting to individual Deputy individuals. Deputy House Leader, come to order. Supplementary. But, Minister, it's clear your government isn't taking these concerns seriously enough. In 2012, the previous Minister of Health warned hospitals they could only treat international patients if no public dollars were used, no Ontario patients displaced, and all the revenue generated was spent on hospital services for Ontarians. Well, clearly that's not happening. These conditions were not adhered to because another warning letter was sent in August 2014. Again, no compliance. Now we have your November Mr. statement. There is no reason to believe, based on past practices, that there will be compliance with this latest statement from your office. So, Minister, will you introduce legislation banning medical tourism here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, perhaps the member opposite hasn't read my most recent letter because and I'm happy to provide her with a copy. It's crystal clear. We are in member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Uh, allowing our hospitals to market and solicit and receive those international patients, precisely the ones that she's talking about. We are ending that practice. Now, two years ago, it's true that a letter was sent by uh, the ministry, followed up this past August, uh, stipulating what at that time were the uh, requirements in place. No tax dollars could go towards this practice. Any revenue needs to come back to uh, service Ontario patients. Uh, it's very clear, and it certainly couldn't uh, uh, impact the care that Ontarians are receiving in any way, shape, or form. We've gone further. We did a review. I initiated a review. In fact, it was my predecessor, uh, uh, the, uh, the current minister, uh, president of the Treasury Board, who initiated the review. We had to get more information to find out precisely what was taking place. We've ended the practice. There's no question that practice is ended. Thank you. New question, the member from Brandon Gormal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, New Democrats tabled a motion that urges the government to move immediately to prevent predatory practices from, by payday loan companies. The motion calls for banning gift card exchanges at exorbitant rates and reducing the fees charged on payday loans from the current $21 per $100. Will the government be siding with the NDP motion, will voting for the NDP motion supporting vulnerable Ontarians, or will this government side with the predatory Payday loan industry. Thank you. Minister of Government. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Consumer appreciate service. the uh, member's oversimplification of the issue. As the uh, member is aware, we have taken uh, swift action around uh, these organizations and with respect to uh, Money Mart in particular, Speaker. Uh, we reached out to them and expressed our displeasure with regard to the practice that they've engaged in. They've suspended that practice immediately, and uh, we need to review the matter further. Uh, as the member also knows, uh, the rate of lending uh, and the aspect around gift cards and the resale of gift cards is not in violation of the current Payday uh, Lending Act 2008. And in fact, there is no province in this country uh, that has uh, gift cards as a resale as part of any existing legislation. I committed to the member that uh, we will review the matter and we will look at uh, the resale yes, of gift cards in the province of Ontario. They stop. Thank, you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Often, Mr. Speaker, doing the right thing can be very simple. Banning practices such as redeeming gift cards for cash at 50% of the card's value is only one of the many areas in the Payday Loan Act that need to be changed and can be changed if the government had the will to do so. I would have thought that forcing vulnerable individuals already under a stress during the holiday season to pay this extraordinary high rate for an exchange, exchange would be something that the government would be motivated to move forward with some legislation to actually ensure that Ontarians are going to be protected moving forward. But apparently this government is not committed to that. In our motion, New Democrats have proposed modest, reasonable Payday Loan Act reforms that would actually protect vulnerable people from this predatory industry. Why won't this government commit to voting for this motion to ensure that we actually support our vulnerable people? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, our government is uh, committed to protecting consumers in the province of Ontario. We have uh, done a consultation uh, with the uh, sector uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, before the election, and uh, we will be acting 
uh, going forward in the new year on uh, proposed changes around the legislation. We do have a new bill to introduce uh, in relation to payday lending in the province with uh, standards that will continue to raise the bar to protect consumers in this province. Uh, we're committed to reviewing the issue around the resale of gift cards, and the member knows full well that the aspect of uh, gift cards being taken for cash value was not, in this instance, part of any payday lending uh, aspect, and if it was, they would be in violation of the Act. Uh, right. we've, uh, we've asked them to cease. They have done that. Uh, we will Answer. look at other ways that we can ensure through charities that uh, folks can receive the funding that they need uh, and, and, uh, Thank you. with uh, respect to the, well those Thank that are you. vulnerable in Ontario. New question, member from Ottawa, Orleans. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Minister, in the past few weeks, both Manulife and the Conference Board of Canada have released studies highlighting the retirement saving challenge of Ontarians. According to the Conference Board, only six in ten Canadians are putting money away for retirement, and most don't feel they have saved enough to live comfortably in their golden years. Manulife study reveals that almost half of Canadians expect to be in debt in retirement. Mr. Speaker, I know some of my residents in my riding have expressed their concerns during my campaign about the retirement saving of their children and the impact that low retirement savings will have on our economy. Minister, I understand that yesterday you introduced legislation that will help strain Ontario's retirement income system. Can you please inform the House how the new legislation Question. will help to strain our retirement system? Thank you, Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and merci to the hardworking member from Ottawa Orleans. Speaker, this undersavings problem in this country is real. It has been a common thread in all my conversations with Ontarians. That is why I was very pleased to stand before the House and introduce the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan Act 2014. If passed, this legislation would create a savings tool for the people of this province designed to give people a secure retirement income floor here, that here. they can rely on. This act would commit the government to establish the ORPP by January 1, 2017, and would enshrine in law some of the key elements of the ORPP that we discussed in our 2014 budget. This act would help millions of Ontarians save for retirement and help move forward a Made in Ontario solution to the retirement undersavings problem. Mr. Speaker, Answer. the cost of inaction is too high. We have an economic imperative that we act now, and that's what our government is doing with this legislation. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci à la ministre. Thank you to the Minister for the answer. To see our government stepping up and taking action to address this important concern for so many Ontarians. I know that constituents in my riding will be keen to learn uh, about the steps our government is taking to address the saving challenge. Mr. Speaker, again through you to the Associate Minister, over the past several weeks, I have had constituents express interest in the administrative body that will administer the plan. Minister, can you please explain to the House how the funds gathered from the ORPP will be managed? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, in our legislation, we reiterated our commitment from the budget and fall economic statement that the ORPP will be designed to mirror many elements of the CPP. The ORPP would be publicly administered at arm's length from government. We will put in place a strong governance model for managing investments here, and administering here. the plan. Here, here. Ontario is home to some of the most largest and most highly regarded pension funds, as stated this week in the New York Times. Speaker. We will be leveraging the expertise in this sector and Ontario's financial services sector. The former CEO of OMERS, Mr. Michael Nobrega, is providing guidance and support on the implementation of the ORPP. In particular, he will provide advice on creating an administrative entity and developing administrative and operational capacity. Sir. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to continuing to work with Mr. Nobrega and the leading experts on our technical advisory group to ensure we create the best possible plan for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, family health teams across the province are losing their qualified staff and finding it difficult to find replacements. These teams, which provide valuable service in rural Ontario, are watching their staff leave to work in hospitals, CCACs and long-term care, where compensation and benefits are better. What is your plan to ensure family health teams have enough staff to care for our communities? Thank you. 
Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm very—I mean, first of all, I'm very proud of the work that all our frontline health care workers uh, do across this province. They are there uh, often and generally when people in, are in their greatest moment of need, and they provide a, a vital and important service. Now, it's important when we look at our health care resource challenge, Mr. Speaker, that we understand that there are from time to time issues of recruitment and retention and as a ministry we're working hard to address those specific sectors within our health care system a perfect example i think was earlier this year when we made the announcement we've now implemented it for our uh, psws or personal support workers where we have increased we will be increasing by four dollars over the next three years to make sure that we're helping to to attract the right people to that uh, that important profession, Mr. Speaker, but also that the ability Answer. to recruit and also sustain and maintain them, particularly in the home and community environment, that that is a viable option. And so, it's certainly, as we look at Thank all the health care sectors, we will continue to uh, take that approach. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, while family health teams are provided funding to hire frontline care staff, they are unable to fill the positions. There is currently a 20 per cent vacancy rate in nurse practitioner positions within our family health teams. So when these positions are left vacant, how are these teams supposed to provide the services people need? So, Minister, uh, again, what is your plan to address this growing recruitment and retention? And it is a crisis. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our plan certainly isn't. In fact, it's the opposite of what the opposition's plan was in the 1990s when they fired more than 6,000 nurses in this province. And in fact, since we came into office, Mr. Speaker, more than 24,000 nurses have been added to this province to help provide health care to people at the front lines. And just for our, and our RNs, more than 10,000 RNs. I met recently with our nurse practitioners a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. They have indicated that they want to work together on the issue of recruitment and retention. We know that there are challenges in certain parts of the province. It's, we have, I would say, led the way for Canada in terms of the construct of the nurse practitioner-led clinic. We now have 25 of them around the province, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to work with our nurse practitioners, yes, as with all nurses, to make sure that they are able to find those jobs and stay in those jobs successfully. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, yesterday your government introduced two different pieces of pension legislation. The first, a fully formed PRPP bill to appease your friends on Bay Street. And the second, little more than an obvious attempt to distract from the first. It is great to see the government getting into the holiday spirit and putting a bow on the PRPP legislation, but Ontarians are not that easily fooled. Speaker, why does your government continue to make deception your first priority? <laughs> Stop the clock. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not particularly enamored with that. Uh, would you please withdraw? I withdraw. Minister of Finance. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. I, I appreciate the member actually having listened to the announcement yesterday. She's absolutely correct. We brought forward for the first, first time in Ontario's history an Ontario Retirement Pension Plan and a retirement security system to provide greater integrity, greater choice, and greater support for people as they retire in the years to come. That, of course, includes providing a complementary plan that is also being adopted across the country. It would be ill-advised and wrong on our part not to offer greater choice to supplement people's retirement security, hence providing a low-cost, pool retirement plan that enables all individuals to yet again provide for their security at a most, much more cost-effective way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government has a lot to say about choice and voluntary savings options, but nearly 50 per cent of working Ontarians will likely be exempted from the ORPP and won't have the option to join. We have years to wait for the design details leader, of the ORPP, time. and hopefully we will have that opportunity to design the best plan possible. As a general rule, the greater the size of the pool, the greater the benefit to pensioners. The more people in the plan, the more money in the pool. So, Mr. Speaker, rather than catering to the interests of their friends on Bay Street, 
Will the government allow exempted Ontarians the opportunity to voluntarily enroll in the ORPP? Is the priority of this government the financial security of banks and insurance companies or the financial security of hardworking Question. Ontarians? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is asking about how are we going to support and provide for an Ontario publicly uh, administered pension plan to support the people of Ontario and hopefully, Mr. Speaker, more people across Canada as other provinces are interested in what we are doing. You voted against that very measure, and now you're standing here asking us how are we going to provide a public plan to support those very people, and yet you voted against it. We are offering that program. We recognize the benefit of having a pooled system that enables more people to benefit from retirement security. And retirement security also includes other plans, other plans that are more cost effective. And that includes the pool register retirement plan with the PRPPs, which is which is what we've advised and which we will be providing in the coming year. Mr. Speaker, they're complementary. They're not plans that are thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and University. Minister, many Ontarians are having difficulty getting back to work because they lack skills and training necessary to fill the jobs of today's economy. I have discussed this with professors and students in my riding of Kingston and the Islands from both St. Lawrence College and Queen's University. At the same time, employers are constantly looking for new ways to recruit and train qualified employees to perform highly skilled work in Ontario's competitive labour market. Our government, along with employers across our province, understands the importance of investing in skills, training, and recognizes that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to developing a workforce with the right skills and knowledge for the new economy. I was able to see the benefits of the critical relationship between our colleges and universities and the workforce Question. firsthand. Minister, we were pleased to see that after months of leadership from Ontario at the bargaining table, you recently announced that the Canada-Ontario job grant is open for business. Thank you. Minister of Training, College Universities. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Kingston and Islands for that question. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to announce that uh, businesses across Ontario can now apply for Canada-Ontario job grants. This grant provides an opportunity for employers to invest in training of their workforce with help from the government. The Canada-Ontario job grant will serve to encourage greater participation of employers in skills training and also enhances employment and skills across our province. Mr. Speaker, thanks to Ontario's hard work, we gained important flexibility for funding the Canada-Ontario job grant and made sure that our most vulnerable workers were not left out in the cold. Mr. Speaker, the quality of our skilled workforce is our single greatest asset in this province, Mr. Speaker, I'm and sure. Ontario's economy is stronger when every Ontarian can contribute to our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for informing the members on how the Canada-Ontario Job Grant is helping Ontarians get back to work and helping employers train their employees to do the highly skilled jobs in Ontario's competitive labour market. It's great to hear that our government is committed to taking on a leadership role in skills and training programs that develop a strong and modernized workforce in Ontario. I know from my riding of Kingston and the Islands that we have some excellent examples of programs that are supporting small businesses and local employment, particularly at St. Lawrence College. Some perfect examples are programs such as the Brick and Stone Masonry Program, Computer Networking and Technical Support, Culinary Management, or the more technical Energy Systems Engineering Technology Question. Program. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about the efforts our government has taken to gather feedback from employers across the province and how we are Thank helping you. accommodate the specific needs of our small Thank business? Thank you. Minister. When I lived, when I lived in Quebec, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, with the help of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, we listened to what businesses across the province of Ontario had to say and we are taking action. Mr. Speaker, we make it easier for small businesses across the province to participate in the Canada-Ontario Job Grant and they will have more flexibility on how to fund their portion of the training. 
We, and we are also asking employers to help us shape two new uh, training in initiatives, Mr. Speaker. One of them is our customized training program, which will develop sector-specific training, and the second one is office skill pilot, which will provide technical training for, uh, for ta tailored for vulnerable workers across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, employer-driven training will help us continue Answer. to build a workforce at the right time for the right place in our province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In response to a question from the Liberal member from Cambridge, the Minister recently stated in the Legislature, I'm proud that, in fact, our government that under our government, every single Ontarian with diabetes who wants a family doctor has one. Would the minister like to retract that statement? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, in a province with 13 million people, it is a challenge, of course, to constantly be able to provide uh, uh, every possible level of health care to every single individual at every single moment in time, but certainly, Mr. Speaker, the progress that we've made on our Ontario diabetes strategy is extraordinary. In fact, it's a model not just in Canada but around the world for the progress that it's made, and, and that objective that we have that every single Ontarian who has diabetes, who wants a family doctor, has one, that objective stands, Mr. Speaker, and I'm motivated and want to work closely with the member opposite if he has identified an individual in the province where that's not the case. Yeah. Speaker, for some of my constituents who have diabetes are spending hours in the emergency room to receive the medical care they need. They could have told this minister that he was wrong. His comments show he's completely out of touch with the reality of the doctor shortage in Perth Wellington. For three years, my office has received calls from those who desperately want and need a doctor. Two weeks ago, we assisted a constituent with his diabetes assessment form from the MTO. He does not have a doctor and came to us for help with his medical paperwork. What does the minister have to say to him and others waiting for about a year on this government's health care connect list? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've come a long way in terms of providing a family doctor to those Ontarians who do want and need one. Mr. Speaker, I think the figure is 94 percent, and maybe within one percentage of that, Mr. Speaker. But we've made an even more ambitious target uh, in our platform that we're going to carry through with in the next several years. And that goal is that every Ontarian that wants a family doctor in this province will be entitled to one and will receive one, whether that's a family doctor or a nurse practitioner but certainly that primary care provider that uh, that individual wants and deserves, Mr. Speaker. So we have come a long way, I have to say, in terms of the provision of yeah. services. And in fact, Health Care Connect is an important part of that, where individuals who don't have a family doctor or a nurse practitioner or primary care provider can actually enroll yes, with Health Care Connect, who works with them dilig diligently to source and connect them with that individual that will provide them with Thank health care services. Thank you. Question the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, yesterday injured workers and their advocates gathered on the steps of the WSIB. They were there to send a message to this government that it's not all right to send hefty safety rebates to companies that have been convicted of health and safety violations that have resulted in workplace deaths. They were there to tell this government that it's not all right to sneak in pre-existing conditions as a reason to deny sick and injured workers their rightful benefits. Why is this government allowing injured workers to be harmed by these reckless policy changes, and why does it send fat checks to companies that have been complicit in workplace deaths? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the um, to the member for that question. I was able to attend the rally yesterday. I had a good conversation with, with many of the injured workers that had shown up to express their concerns. And certainly these are concerns that have been expressed over the years as each government, each successive government, seeks to improve the system. And often we talk about the premium rates, we talk about experience rating, and I think what we need to do is remember that this system was put in place to treat injured workers. And Speaker, that's what we've been doing at uh, the Ministry of Labour and the WSIB is doing a review on its benefits policy. It's doing a review on its pre-existing conditions, Speaker. It's consulting 
with the injured workers community. It's uh, consulting with labour. It's consulting with business. I'm optimistic, Speaker, at the end of this process, we're going to have an improved process in place for injured workers in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate uh, the Minister's uh, acknowledgement and reference to the historical significance of why we have the WSIB in Ontario, because under the Justice William Meredith principles agreed uh, and reached in 1913, workers gave up their rights to sue their employers with the expectation of receiving just and fair compensation if they were injured on the job. A just and fair treatment is what injured workers expect, and it's what this government should ensure is provided. But it's not what's happening at the WSIB these days. Every one of the members in this chamber knows that and should acknowledge that. Profoundly unfair and anti-worker policies are being brought in secretly without any oversight from this legislature. When will this government ensure that injured and sick workers are treated with the respect and dignity that they deserve? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the supplementary. And I think we all agree in this House that injured workers in this province deserve to be treated with respect, deserve to be treated with dignity. I don't think that's in question, Speaker. Often from time to time, the WSIB takes a look at its own practices and policies. It takes, uh, it takes comments from individuals that have, that have availed themselves of the system. It talks to people from the labour community. It talks to people from the employer community, and it seeks to put in, a pla uh, in place a system that is fair to all employees in this province. As a result of the input that has come in from, uh, from labour groups, from injured workers groups, changes have been made to the pre-existing policies, changes have been made to the benefit policies. I'm hopeful, Speaker, as we move ahead uh, with the input from the three parties and from the opposition parties, that we see further changes to the experience yes, rating programme as well. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, member from the Public North. Monsieur le Président, ma question est pour la ministre des Services sociaux et communautaires. To the uh, Minister of Social Services. Last week we celebrated the United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and tomorrow will be the United Nations Human Rights Day. These important days, as you'll know, is a, are an opportunity for all of us to acknowledge the challenges and barriers, including, of course, poverty and discrimination that people with disabilities face every day. This is especially important in my own riding of Etobicoke North. Your ministry and this government have taken a strong position on recognizing individuals with disabilities, in particular their right to inclusion, support and having the same opportunities as all Ontarians. This includes introducing the landmark piece of legislation, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, almost 10 years ago. Minister, I ask you, doctor to doctor, what has the government done recently to help people who are living with disabilities reach their full potential? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for his question. And will continue to do in this area is crucial to upholding the human rights and advancing the quality of life of all Ontarians. As Minister of Community and Social Services, I look forward to realizing our government's commitments to ensuring Ontarians with disabilities are better supported. Over the past two years, our government has made significant improvements to the Ontario Disability Support here, Program. Here, here. Now, everyone who works can earn up to $200 without having their assistance benefits reduced at all. And for earnings above $200, benefits are reduced only by 50 cents on every dollar earned. Beginning in April 2015, a new streamlined employment benefit Answer. will be introduced to support our ODSP recipients in finding competitive employment. With the new benefit, recipients with disabilities will be able to access up to $1,800 to help realize Thank their you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. We appreciate your stewardship of these files, and of course, the recent changes will make a tangible difference for people finding and maintaining employment. A number of agencies in my own riding of Etobicoke North are doing great work to support individuals in their daily lives and to seek better integration in their communities and the economy. However, unfortunately, it's still a reality that individuals living with disabilities face enhanced challenges. In Ontario, for example, one in seven people have some type of disability. This means about 62,000 adults and 28,000 children. The ability for an individual to pursue competitive employment can be one of the most fulfilling life experiences, especially for someone who may have thought they never could. 
Speaker, how has this government supporting individuals with developmental disabilities helping to pursue their goals in employment? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My mandate is to drive forward the transformation of supports for those living with disabilities. This means ensuring these individuals have access to the right assistance so they can pursue the same opportunities in our communities and economy. Recently, we launched a Developmental Services Employment and Modernization Fund with the goal of making integrated employment in the community the preferred outcome for people with a developmental disability. This investment of up to $15 million over the next three years will promote inclusive work environments and opportunities for people with developmental disabilities to find competitive employment, develop successful job skills, and contribute to the growth of the province. This new fund has already received 260 submissions from agencies in its first allotment. The successful applications will be announced Answer. early 2015. If our province is to realize its full potential, then we must be sure that all Ontarians can reach their own individual potential. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, your flawed Bill 10 was time allocated through this House at record speed without uh, hardly any consultation and almost no debate. During the committee hearings, your PA, the member from Glengarry Prescott Ruskell, informed deputants that they would be part of a minister's roundtable that would provide input into drafting regulations. Minister, can you inform the House today when the roundtable discussions will take place and if that input will include members of the Coalition of Independent Child Care Providers? And if you are not including the Coalition, are you telling the people in the province that they have, they have to go to a court of law to get fair representation? Yes, uh, what, what will happen is we've got extensive regula uh, regulations that uh, need to be done with Bill 10. One of the uh, amendments that people might be interested that we did include with Bill 10 at the hearings uh, was to actually put it in writing to make our intent clear that the uh, new re regulations for the unlicensed home uh, child care sector will not take place, uh, take effect until January of 2016, which means that there's a transition period of a year, and we've put that right in the law, so it will be absolutely clear to everyone. Uh, so what, I, what I'm saying here is there are a lot of re uh, regulations to uh, be uh, uh, right, to be to be uh, developed, and we will do what we always do. We will post each and every regulation for 45 days. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah, Minister, I never heard an answer on that. Um, are you not ashamed of how the House Leader jammed this bill 10 through for you? But I want to give him credit. He made sure you secretly made it to Ottawa, and he made sure you we made. We had 93 amendments motions passed in less than 43 in less than 40 minutes without debate. A record. And I want to thank you both because we now have some excellent new candidates who want to put their names forward for our party because of the way that you treated them and the way that you treated the ICPs on Bill 10. So I ask again, I just like a clear answer. When can we expect your regulation roundtables and will and will independent child care be child care be provi providers be included? or not included. I just want an answer. You never included the answer. You made it up. You met, you've done each of you've talked question. about amendments. You never, you never answered my question. Thank you. Minister. Actually, I did answer your question. When we post something for 45 days, that means that there is a 45-day period during which any member of the public who wishes to comment on the regulation is uh, able to do so, which is actually what my parliamentary assistant committed to, is that there would be consultations. Well, when you post a regulation, trust me, we know this in the child care area, we get hundreds of responses and we collect the responses and we analyze and then we adjust the regulation. That's what the consultation will do. But it is interesting to know what the real interest in Bill 10 was. They wanted to recruit more candidates. All the politics. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Southwestern Ontario is home to some of the most beautiful countryside in Ontario. It includes prime farmland that feeds.
the, uh, the member from Simcoe North will come to order. And the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. The, uh, I wouldn't take it any further, please. Please finish your question. Thank you, Speaker. It's to the Premier. I'm talking about the farmland in southwestern Ontario that feeds Ontario watersheds that flow into three Great Lakes. It also includes the northwestern tip of the Marcellus Shale, the same rock formation that hosts fracking operations in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and have caused so much environmental devastation. Recently, the governments of Quebec, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador, and New Brunswick have taken action to address this new environmental threat. Will the government follow their lead and impose a moratorium on fracking? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, Speaker, thank you very much, and, uh, and I want to thank the member for the question. It's, it's interesting. I was wondering if perhaps at some point we'd, we'd hear a question on this issue in the, in the House, and I'd ask my staff uh, some time ago to provide me with as much information as is possible. Indeed, if a question had arisen on this particular issue, it's a sensitive issue. I know that the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change also takes specific interest in this issue. What I can tell you is that should there be uh, a need to move forward with this process in Ontario, that there is legislation in effect, I believe it's called the Oil and Gas Act, that would be required to be changed uh, before fracking could be allowed in the province of Ontario. And what I can tell you right now, Speaker, is that there are no applications, as I understand it, because I've asked my staff to get back to me on this, currently before the, uh, my ministry or any other ministry that I'm Answer. aware of. So currently nothing before us, and in fact, I'm told if in fact there was, it would require legislative change before it could move forward. Here. Two supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The American company Lone Pine is suing the Quebec government under the North American Free Trade Agreement for loss of future business due to its moratorium on fracking. Lone Pine believes it has the right to frack under the St. Lawrence River. If Ontario doesn't take action now, other companies will lay claim to our countryside and then claim a permanent right to frack before we know what the environmental risks are. At least two companies are considering fracking in southwestern Ontario. Will the government impose a moratorium on fracking now before it's too late? Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, as I mentioned in the, in the original question, as I understand it right now, and, and I will check further, but I've asked this question and I've been told that should anybody look to be uh, trying to move forward with fracking in the, in the uh, province of Ontario. In fact, legislative change would be required. So that, I guess, if it's accurate, would mean that a moratorium at this point is unnecessary. Having uh, given the fact that the members raised the question, I will endeavour again to look into this to be sure what I'm conveying to you is in fact accurate. But as it stands today, the information that's been provided to me when I asked for it indicates very clearly that right now you cannot go forward and frack in Ontario unless there's legislative change uh, in the province. Yeah, yeah. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 8, an act to promote public sector and MPP accountability and transparency by enacting a broader public sector executive compensation act 2014 and amend various acts. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. Sergeant at Arms is coming for you. Just give him. On December the 8th, Ms. Matthews moved third reading of Bill 8. All those in favor, please rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Torizetti. Mr. Torizetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Yeah. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Man. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. It should be sung. It should be sung. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Jolinon. Madame Jolinon. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadasha. Mr. Nadasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 77 and the nays being 17, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Troisième lecture, Projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.